Um, hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, people, please feel free to grab your lunches and take a seat. Uh, but Sasha will be starting now. Um, so it's my pleasure to to introduce Sasha Rachlin, who's uh, currently at MIT. He's a professor there. Um, he's been a professor there for a few years. But before that, he was at uh, UPenn in the statistics um, department. And uh, he's also very modest, so he gave me a three-line bio. But uh, his interests are in mathematical statistics and machine learning, and he's done a lot of really, really cool work um, that I'm sure many of you have seen. I have certainly seen in the past. Um, and today he's going to be telling us about the foundations of interactive decision making. Um, so please take it away, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Does this work? Hopefully. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I, this might. There's of course time at Dirto Tech, and it's always a pleasure to see everyone and and and, and chat. So I'm going to be describing work. Um, uh, with a bunch of people, um, but I want to highlight one person, which is a uh, Dylan Foster. There are two D Fosters here, but um, uh, Dylan Foster is, is, a, is a key driver of, of much of this work. Um, and uh, it's something I've been interested in for the past three years, um, but uh, there are some, I think, avenues for both statisticians and optimizers to uh, advance some of the questions I'm gonna be discussing. Um, this is shaped as a as a kind of as, as a Roman Colosseum or I don't know <laughs> steps uh, and and people looking over you 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 can imagine people looking over you know from the balconies uh, uh, so uh, oh this is working let's see work it worked before. Um, oh, here, yes, yes, okay. So uh, appropriately, I didn't know about the setup, but appropriately the talk is divided into several acts with a prologue and the epilogue. Um, the uh, uh, the first act will be uh, about the topic of online estimation. The second one is about interactive decision-making. And in the third act, the, the, the main actors will come together to resolve some interesting uh, questions. Um, the let me start with a with a very quick motivation um in in machine learning we are very good at predicting patterns we uh collect huge amounts of data and we fit our models to this uh, passively collected data uh, there are lots of successes in image classification recognition translation you name it right then there is another type of uh decision making flavor of machine learning, which is to actively gather information or make decisions that result in information being conveyed to you. So examples of this is clinical decision systems, recommendation systems, robotics, game playing, and so forth. And let me just look at the chat in case people cannot, still cannot hear. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's fine now. All right. So, um, this type of decision making problem is is the one that I'm interested in and uh broadly I can uh okay I, I, I can show this the following cartoon this is the ultimately the problem that I'm interested in um where let's say a doctor or or a decision maker interacts with the environment or in this case a sequence of patients each patient uh, arise with their own XT, which is a medical history, uh, a list of symptoms, let's say. The doctor makes a decision, pi T, um, that could be a, a simple decision of which uh, medication to prescribe, or it could be a, a complicated decision of a treatment strategy. Uh, so think of pi T as do this and then a tree. And if it doesn't work, then do this and then look at the symptoms and do that. Okay, So it could be a complicated uh, object and um, upon the, um, making that decision either immediately or after some time let's say the doctor observes reward um, it's it's a measure of how good that decision was and there is some auxiliary observation that will come in uh, in the third act um, uh, um, play play a certain role ot 
So this OT could be something about the disease progression, let's say, that helps the doctor beyond whether the person got better or not, right? The so reward is an objective measure of how well uh, the, the, the uh, patient is performing, but uh, O is some auxiliary observation, okay? Now, this is a very abstract problem, and okay, I don't know how to, let's say, a priori, how to model this, but I will propose some possibilities, and of course, we're open to discussions uh, whether that's appropriate. The same problem is relevant to recommendation systems. Uh, you have uh, Meta, Apple, uh, and, and, and so forth, uh, observing the user's context, making a product recommendation, and then observing, let's say, reward whether the person clicked or not. That's a reward. And then maybe auxiliary observation is something about you know how hesitant was the person to buy this product or what other products the person looked at and so forth. Okay. So um, even though it's stated in, in such a simple manner as this interaction, um, it actually subsumes uh, what's called episodic reinforcement learning, or at least a, a big part of what, what is called uh, episodic reinforcement learning. And the way that it does it, I'll flesh it out later, but you can think of each pi t, each decision, as a strategy you give to a robot the robot goes, uh, uh, you know, washes dishes, and then you see some uh, information, and then you update, you know, you have reward and, and observations, okay? And then you keep doing it until, and you hope that the robot improves in the same way that you hope that the doctor learns to uh, predict better and better. All right. Um, what I will uh, try to convince you today is that this complicated problem of decision-making can be separated into two parts and hence two acts. The first part is estimation, but not any estimation, not, not the classical estimation, uh, uh, online estimation. And then the second part is exploration, which is driven by a certain optimization problem, which is very specific. I'll write it down. For some cases, we'll be able to solve it. For some other cases, it's still open. Okay. All right, so let's go to the first act, online estimation. And, and I'm going to start with uh, something that uh, if you have taken uh, a, a course in uh, statistics that you, you, would, you would learn, um, this is fixed design regression. So typically these pies are Xs um, to be consistent with the way that we're gonna be using these results. I'm gonna keep them as pies. So you have a fixed sequence of pies, pi one through pi t, and you observe noisy values of some unknown function at these values, okay? And okay. so uh, um, the, the noise is epsilon t, and that's, let's say, independent, sub-Gaussian, and what you know is that f star belongs to some class of functions, okay? If, if this class of function is, let's say, uh, neural networks, then you're asking, can I uh, predict the actual values of, of f star uh, can I denoise the, the, the noisy YTs and, and have some guarantee about the closeness on the data, on the fixed design, pi 1 through pi t, or pi, uh, pi 1 through pi t, yes, um, in terms of squared error. And um, if the class is finite, if this collection of models is finite, then a simple uh, uh, application of Bernstein inequality will tell you that the sum uh, grows at most as log cardinality of that. Okay, so for how many of you, this is, or, or how many of you believe this uh, that this is true? Okay. So it, it's it's a Bernstein inequality, um, not not much more. Half half a page proof. Okay. Right. Uh, then then uh, we teach random design regression. So in in Machine learning applications, the x's, or in my case, the pi's, are iid from some distribution. Uh, let's say, call it p. Then uh, uh, least squares, oh, by the way, I, I didn't say, but least squares satisfy this, this uh, desired uh, upper bound, right? So just uh, empirical risk minimization or least squares, uh, which is just the best fit within the model class to, to the data. Um, same thing for the random design regression. You can you can show that now now all these terms are the same. Um, 
because it's a, it's it's evaluated at a random point, and and so you can prove uh, uh, the L two distance between the f hat and f star it grows no more than log f. Okay. So a slightly more interesting setting: random design, same upper bound, and uh, if the class f is not finite, then you have a, a large body of literature in statistical learning telling you and, and mathematical statistics telling you what you know what what is the right complexity of a class if it's not finite right so the the results uh, you know in the fixed design you can look up the Saravan the yearbook uh, with with the, all the fixed points and so forth uh, Valodia Kalchinsky uh, uh, has, a, has a book with the random design uh, uh, there is a way to to go between the regret formulation and and the uh, square distance between the the functions uh, easily. But uh, morally, um, this is pretty well understood. So it, it potentially some other slightly different complexity, which depends on some fixed points that are maybe different from the fixed points up there. But this is well understood. Okay, so so uh, probably many of you have seen this. Uh, maybe fewer of you have seen this type of results. And this type of result is for an individual sequence, which is being revealed to the decision maker or to the predictor one at a time. So here uh, we have uh, online regression with individual sequences. Pi 1 through pi t is an arbitrary sequence. So before it's, it's an arbitrary set of points in the fixed design, right? But here it's an arbitrary sequence, which can actually depend on anything that happened in the past. And again, once again, you're you're observing the the noisy values of this function, uh, and you know that the function unknown uh, uh, function f star belongs to this class. Okay, and uh, uh, in this case, there exists a sequence of estimators f hat such that uh, the prediction error on the data points is again. Uh, log cardinality of f, or uh, what we call sequential complexity of the class f. Okay. So here the problem is a little bit more complicated because you only see uh, prefixes of the data, and at every time step you need to predict the next denoise the, the the next value. Right. But what this result shows is that you're able to do that, even if the sequence is arbitrary and it's not fixed and given to you ahead of time. Now, the results of this form, uh, if you come from computer science, are, uh, and, and let's say you, you, you've taken machine learning 101, um, if, if the class is finite and there is no noise, that's a halving algorithm, right? At least for this log cardinality of f, this is the halving algorithm, or the method of centers of gravity and optimization, if you wish. It's the same, same idea. Um, if there is noise, then the result is not due to ERM, but due to uh, exponential, exponential weights. So you have to run some more sophisticated procedure. Empirical risk minimization doesn't actually, least squares doesn't give you this log F. Um, and that result is due to Valody uh, Wolfk, uh, and, and, and uh, you can read about in Chesebian uh, Kilugosi. Now, in general, the sequential complexity uh, is something that we've studied quite a bit. Um, there is a, a paper that computes this sequential complexity for an arbitrary class of functions. And, and the point here is that the sequential complexity could be different from the complexity from the fixed points that I was showing before, from the complexity in the IID case. Okay. So it, it could be, in fact, that uh, this one is infinite or vacuous, and this one is not vacuous. And we understand cases where it isn't, okay? Are there any questions at this point? Yes. I've seen like a lot of online regret forms. You know, often you have like a square root t or like t kind of stuff. Like, can you compare like why this would be? Yes, yes. So uh, if you come from uh, um, online learning literature, there are two things here that are different. One is there is no regret. So we're not doing prediction minus minimum over class prediction. But under this assumption that the model is well specified, that the F star belongs to the class, these are 
essentially equivalent. So that's the first difference. And the second difference is that you expect what are called fast rates for square loss, um, at least in statistics, for instance. Uh, you would expect, you know, d over n rate for regression, for instance. Uh, um, and, and, and here it's the fast rate again, right? So it's the fast rate because if you do to normalize by 1 over t, you would get the 1 over t log f. Okay. Good, good questions. Other questions? Okay. So we can actually um, expand in between these two extremes, between the IID data, which might not be relevant in many applications, and in the, the, the worst case data, the individual sequence data. Um, there is something called smooth data, which seems quite reasonable, for which you can still prove uh, uh, a, a, a non-trivial result. And, and uh, the smooth data is defined as follows. Um, it's a stochastic process. So pi, pi t's are coming from a stochastic process. And the distribution of the next pi t, given the past, has a bounded radon Nicodemus derivative with respect to some mu, which we may or may not know. Okay. So this, this is a, we call it smooth data. Uh, motivation for this came from thinking about an adversarial choice which gets perturbed, so the hand of the adversary trembles. Uh, and, and, and kind of in, in parallel with uh, uh, Spielman Tank and kind of the smooth analysis, you can, you can show that for, uh, such data is more benign than really the worst case data. Okay, the rest is the same. So I'm, I'm keeping everything the same, only the, the way that the pies are generated is different. And, and for this, you can show that a sequence of least squares um, has the following property, that again, the denoising, the prediction error on that sequence um, is sublinear, or if you divide by t, then you get one over square root of t. And here it's an interesting question because we, we, we can show that least squares, is, the, is that, that is the rate for least squares, that cannot be improved. Um, but but it's still open. What whether you can do anything faster? Whether you can get fast rates for uh, for, for uh, the smooth data? Okay. All right. So so uh, um, are there any questions about this setting? I just want to say that uh, uh, my, uh, my, much of the results in in the non IID data literature has been on mixing conditions, beta mixing, alpha mixing, and so forth. But they're inevitably they're reducing. They're blocking, uh, they're reducing the problem back to kind of IID like. And, and this is quite a bit beyond because you, you can have a mu that's base measure, and then the PT is just you know shifting, and there is no mixing, right? The only thing that you require is that it has a bounded uh, derivative. Yes. I'm a little bit lost yes. as to how <clears throat> those results relate to the interactive decision. Not yet. That's Act yeah. Two. Okay. Yes, it's coming. I, I I want to preload Act One so that uh, we get things. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So, um, something related to covering numbers, VC dimension. Uh, typically, because of the fast rates, this comes from fixed points of some. Read Volod is a book, uh, or that, that's a good, that's a good, uh, yeah. good place. Um, I, but I want to point out that this is the the classical complexity. This is not the, not not the sequential complexity. That's important because we're, we're back to the IID setting with the worst rate. But but uh, 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 yeah. so we just put 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 this result. In. Is this complexity in this problem the same as on the previous slide, or is different? Um. Good question. So, so lo, lo, log f is, is for a finite, it's log f. Um, and uh, it is given by, uh, yes, it, it is the same. It, it is the same. Yes. Um, the, the, the proof is, 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 is quite neat. Uh, it requires coupling ideas. Uh, it requires uh, proving uh, like Bousquet style norm comparison, but for uh, martingales, and, and that's it's quite quite uh, quite interesting. Okay, um, all right. So, 
even if you didn't pay attention to the details, it's time to reset. And the only thing you need to remember is that classical regression, the bread and butter for statisticians, can be extended to sequences that are not IID or not known ahead of time and fixed, okay? And in particular, it can be either arbitrary, although with sequential complexity or smooth data with the IID complexity, okay? All right, so now, now it's time to reset and uh, talk about interactive decision-making. Okay, so, so we're back in this situation and, and uh, for simplicity, I will be removing some of these errors to make the problem simpler. In particular, I will first remove the context arrow, which uh, we'll get to in the very end, and I'll remove the observation OT. So it's really just decision, and then you receive the reward. Well, the simplest uh, version of this problem is, is a multi-arm bandit problem. There are a finite number of decisions. You make a one of the finite choices, and then you observe the noisy reward for that choice, for that arm, okay? Um, how many of you are familiar with multi-arm bandits? So a, a good portion, great. So um, F star is just the mean of the reward. This is zero mean noise for that pi t, for that decision pi t. Okay. So let me just briefly talk about this, uh, um, the, the goal. The goal of the decision maker is to select pi t's we're maximizing so that we're almost as good as the best alarm or if you knew the arm, you would just you know, pull the, the arm with the maximal mean for, the, for t steps, right? And, and uh, of course, you don't know which mean is the largest, and so you have to adaptively try uh, the different arms. And um, the hope is that regret of the decision maker, written as the suboptimality, is not too big, okay? A classical algorithm for this that goes back to 1985 uh, is the UCB algorithm, uh, upper confidence bound. And, and what it says is the following. Imagine that this is the, the, these are the four arms and you've collected uh, those rewards in the vertical axis and the Y axis. Um, and and uh, you can compute the sample mean and sample standard deviation for each arm. So now if you're in this picture, what should, which one should you pull? Which one should you choose? What, what, what decision? Um, and, and the UCB algorithm says, pick the one that, pick, pick the decision pi that maximizes the sample mean plus the standard deviation. So the, the, the hope is that if the sample mean is large, maybe that's a good arm um, and then UCB is high, uh, or maybe the standard deviation is very high, but then by pulling that arm, you decrease the standard deviation, the uncertainty. So it's 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 a procedure that combines exploration and exploitation kind of in one in one go. But okay, this is a formula you, you know you, you don't need to look at it. It's it's a, it's a very precise you know, form. So so why does that work? Why does optimism work? Um, even though we just discussed finite number of arms, I'm gonna pretend that this is a continuum of arm. It's good to start getting used to a continuum of arms. Um, ultimately, that's the interest. Um, and then you have a uh, the mean. Right? So somehow you found, uh, let's say, least squares solution to all the data you've observed so far. Um, you put a confidence interval at each point, right? That these are the confidence bands that with high probability contain the true F star. Okay, that's the purpose of simultaneous confidence bands. And um, uh, the, uh, the UCB algorithm says pick that point because it maximizes the mean plus the confidence band, okay? The, the top of the confidence band. Um, now, the, 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 true, uh, the true optimal decision we're maximizing, well, this is the one that maximizes the blue curve, right? So, so how far are we off? Well, we're off by the difference in the heights between red and green. Ooh. And... Uh, that is bounded because we're, we're, we took the upper envelope. That's bounded by the width of the confidence band at this point. So you see that for this method to work, you need to guarantee that confidence bands simultaneously shrink everywhere, right? 
And it does work for, for a finite multi-arm bandit problem. They do shrink because you get more data. There are only that many options. One of them has to shrink. Now, the, uh, let, let me make the problem a little bit more interesting and more akin to kind of machine learning, right? Um, the we, we call it structured bandits, or, or other people call it structure, structured bandits. It's exactly the same setup, except I think of pi now as a large space, possibly continuous, possibly a space of strategies for a robot, possibly some combinatorial crazy space with some uh, unclear structure. Okay. The rest is the same, right? Okay, so we, the assumption here again is that the mean reward function belongs to a class F, which is not all the possibilities, but it's, you know, it has uh, some bounded statistical, so to say, capacity, right? Um, in the multi arm bandit case, we have no, in, in the general setting, we don't have an assumption about the structure of the arms, right? They could be anything, the structure of the means. Here we have a structure about the mean of the uh, of the reward. Okay, um, and uh, um, again, the goal as before is to minimize regret. I'm just putting it out there, right? So one example of this is uh, what's called linear bandits. Uh, this class F is just a class of linear functions. Pi is a d-dimensional vector. Uh, theta is the unknown parameter. There is one correct theta. Uh, you choose a decision, you get a noise observation of pi t theta star plus noise, right? Um, and uh, this has been extended in this work, Lin UCB. Um, I should put uh, credits, but uh, about 10 years ago, uh, it was shown that you know the, the idea of confidence bands can be extended to linear uh, multi-arm bandits. Um, and, um, and, and, and then what, so, so what's the reason for that? The, the, the reason is that we can still construct a con, uh, kind of simultaneous confidence bands and there are only D dimensions. So somehow things have to shrink uh, as you choose these directions, things have to uh, start, you know, the, the, the ellipsoid, uncertainty ellipsoid starts shrinking. Okay, that's the idea. And so, so one, one can ask, is this the right principle? Is, is optimism the right principle? in general for structured bandits, right? I give you a class F, neural networks or whatever, uh, you know, holder function, what, what have you. It, 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 should we be trying to construct these confidence bands? And the answer is no. Uh, and it's essentially because, um, well, it's, it's the wrong approach. Um, let me try to convince you. Um, uh, suppose that my class F contains three functions but they're all maximized at the same decision. Now I know my class F. I, I suppose I have infinite computation. I can just figure out, oh, this, this problem, you don't need to do anything, right? This is the optimal R. So whatever my complexity is, um, it should say, you know, one round is enough or, or zero rounds is, right? There's nothing to be learned, right? Now this one is a, is, is a difficult problem. They're shifted. And so, because I'm getting noise observations, I need to spend a lot of time in that region to figure out what is the right, what is the right model. I don't know which one is correct. Right? I'm getting noisy observations, noisy zeroth order observations about uh, my queries, right? And and you know if you shift them just a bit, uh, you know that that's a compli complicated problem. So whatever my measure of complexity for this problem, um, it should say a lot of queries for this. But now imagine that I have this. Uh, suboptimal arm, which gives me a lot of information. It has a, a large uh, information gain, even though it's a bad arm, right? So, you know, you can think of a doctor uh, having to, uh, unfortunately, give uh, bad medication to, 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 to uh, you know, a person that can, not, not, a good, not a good idea, but, uh, but learning a lot about this, right? So, so sacrificing uh, maybe an animal to learn something. I, I'm sorry for, for bad analogies, but you, you can see, right? So, so it seems like a complicated problem because this one is all of a sudden easy. It gives you a lot of signal to noise ratio. Uh, so you can figure out the model and then go to the maximum of that model. Um, and, and, and so how do, we, how do we solve it? 
Um, and, and UCB, both UCB and Thompson sampling will fail at this problem. So both UCB and Thompson sampling are not the right approaches for this uh, problem. Now it's time to, to, to discuss what is it that we want. The object of interest for me is, well, something, no matter what research area you're in, you can probably write down your mathematical problem in this form, right? It's the find the best algorithm over the worst problem uh, where you're trying to optimize some performance of the algorithm on the on that problem, right? So, you know, statistical learning can be written this way, optimization, you know, anything can be written this way. Um, but what, what does it mean to understand the, the problem, at least uh, coming from, you know, statistical learning? Well, it means that you find nearly matching functions of time or, or the number of data points and the class of functions that are nearly matching, right? So if you can do it for any f, it constitutes some understanding of what makes the problem difficult, right? Because the, these functions, little phi and capital phi, somehow end up capturing um, what properties of this collection of models are difficult. So if we are to find for this interactive decision-making a matching phi and phi, um, it has to be that somehow in, in these examples that I showed you, it understands that you know functions that are maximized at the same point are is an easy case, shifted is hard, and and then you know having a lot of information somewhere else is is an easy case again. Okay, so um, what I'm going to tell you is that in fact one can uh, obtain near almost near optimal phi and and, and little phi and capital phi uh, in, in 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 quite a bit of generality, and this is done by decomposing the problem into online estimation, which I presented in act one, and exploration, which I am about to present to you. Any questions about this? Go, go to the grand finale. Okay, this is the only slide with, slide with mathematics that I will have. Um, so we, we start with our uh, regret of our decision pi. Pi is our decision. Um, it has some suboptimality. We're maximizing, so this is our suboptimality. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add and subtract a square distance between the unknown f star. Well, it, this f star is also unknown to some f hat, which is computed as a secondary uh, optimization problem. So this f hat jumping ahead will be the estimator from part one is the online estimator, online these squares estimator. Okay. So I, I didn't do anything, right? Whenever you have equality, nothing interesting can be there unless you're a physicist, right? In which case it, it, it is interesting, right? But in, in, in our field, uh, uh, only inequalities are interesting, right? So nothing is interesting here. Um, now I'm just gonna take expectations because my decision is randomized. My my. Uh, decision pi can can be a randomized decision, and it should be, because there are some obstacles in certain cases against deterministic methods. Um, now I'm just summing over t time steps, right? The only thing I did here is I made this pi into pi t, summed it over t iterations, and uh, collected the terms in, 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 in this manner. And what you can see, uh, the, the second term here is our friend from act one, right? If f hat t is an online estimate of f star at pi t, then um, that is the denoising error uh, on the sequence pi t. But the problem is pi t is a sequence of decisions that we make. So we cannot claim that this is a fixed known design, a fixed design regression. We cannot claim that it's a random design regression because that's not the IID, right? It really requires this uh, um, robustness against arbitrary sequences, yeah. I will also discuss that this can be extended to smooth data. That's, that's an interesting uh, uh, extension. Okay, and, and now uh, I, I'm going to claim that this is some form of exploration complexity. It's it's the 
how complex is the problem of exploration in your particular problem? And this is just what we called est SQ, estimation error with respect to the squared distance. Okay. All right. I mean, I haven't done anything, right? I, I've just rewritten regret in the following way with equality. Okay, so it's time to introduce some notions um, which serve as the complexity of the problem in terms of um, how difficult it is to make decisions in this problem. And uh, the I, I'm, I'm just taking the, from the previous slide, I'm taking this part and I'm looking for the worst that this can be, okay? What is the worst that this difference can be? Well, let's give it a name. The, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm calling it a decision estimation coefficient. This was this is coming from the work with uh, Dylan Foster and then Dylan Foster and Sham Kakade and, and, and uh, uh, John Chan. Uh, and uh, the it's the minimum over my randomization over the decision space, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to come up with uh, uh, good decisions. Uh, max over the unknown model in the class F, right? because I don't know what F star is, so I'm just gonna upper bound it by F. And then the, the difference between how much we regret making that decision uh, with the suboptimality sub of this decision, right? Just this is the pi star versus our randomized uh, decision versus the estimation error, right? Uh, that, the, this term, you can also think about this term as a information gain you get from the, the making a decision. The reason for that is the online estimation guaranteeing like log cardinality F tells you that, you, that, that there is a budget of mistakes that you're gonna make. You cannot make that many, more than log F mistakes, more than log cardinality, right? So if you've got something that has a large difference, that's good actually, because first of all, you're subtracting that quantity, right? And if you, if you make a large mistake, um, the DEC is, is large, but on the estimation side, there are only that many times that you can do it. That, that's roughly the intuition for what, what, what's happening here. Um, there is a constrained version of this, which is a maximize regret subject to squared error being less than epsilon. Think of this as Lagrangian, uh, or, or the top one is the Lagrangian version of the, the bond, right? So we call it the constrained DEC. All right. Um, it also gives you a meta algorithm, which is just solve that DEC at time t. This is the distribution from which you sample the next decision. You get your reward, and then you feed it into the next uh, online estimate of f hat t. You resolve the estimation problem, and then you continue, right? This is a meta algorithm. Uh, um, that just comes out of writing the DC code. Not, nothing difficult here. Okay, so uh, results. First result is that the you have an upper bound in terms of this DC, which is a trivial, hopefully trivial thing, given what I showed you, right? Because we, we, we had an upper bound and there was equality. And then if you take the max of that, uh, that that's the DC, right? So the upper bound should be trivial at this point. The interesting thing is the lower bound. The, the interesting part is that this DC is inherent in any problem. You take any class F, there is a lower bound in terms of this DC. So it is something that characterizes whether decision making is possible for this particular problem. Right, so think of this as a VC, you know, notion of VC dimension for decision making, if you wish. Uh, Okay, there are a number of differences here, and we resolved all but one uh, gap between the upper and lower bound. Uh, and, and we're about, to, hopefully, about to close that as well. Um, uh, maybe in the interest of, of time, I will only refer to one, or well, this un, 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 unresolved gap, and that the upper bound has the estimation error in there, and the lower, lower bound doesn't. And, and resolving this issue is, is quite subtle. 
Um, and okay, hopefully in the next you know half a year we'll we'll have some solution. Okay, um, we can compute this uh, you know VC dimension or the DC dimension for 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 many examples. In multi-arm bandits, you get uh, DC, which is scaling as a over gamma. In linear bandits, it's d over gamma. In general, for many classes, the if, uh, the dimension is something like some kind of effective dimension over gamma. Um, for non-parametric bandits, you have non-parametric rates, and so the DC scales as gamma to one over d plus one. Um, this, these are Lipschitz functions in d dimensions, and so forth. So you you can you can turn the crank and and uh, compute this DC uh, uh, for your problem of interest. Okay. All right, so. Um, I'm, I'm going to make one more addition, um, and I will add back those observations. Okay, so now not only do we get the reward upon making a decision, but we only also get some observation. And and the way that we model it is that instead of a class F, and F star belongs to F, we have a class of probability distributions, and M star is one such probability distribution, and is, there is one true M star. And what we're getting is we're getting reward comma observations jointly from this uh, probability distribution when we make a decision, okay? So just, just one little tiny change. Um, but let me quickly say that reinforcement learning now falls under this umbrella. L let me actually skip this. So, so if you've seen episodic reinforcement learning as just some MDP which you were trying to control and, and the to get rewards and, and, and the, uh, the, the multi-step policy is the decision that we want to consider, okay? So in, in the setting set pi, the set of decisions is just a set of these H step policies. Um, observation is the trajectory, uh, uh, state action reward pairs, uh, tuples and, and, and so forth. So what's the analog of the DEC for this more uh, rich setting. Well, the analog is, uh, this is the constrained version, is it's, it's exactly the same as before, except now we have to measure the Hellinger distance between uh, a reference model M hat, which we fit using online regression again, uh, or online density estimation, I should say, uh, and uh, uh, this, this potentially worst case model M. Okay, so there's an extension, which is quite natural, in the case that you only have rewards, you don't have extra observation, sufficient statistic is just the mean of the distribution, and Hellinger distance just becomes equivalent to square distance between the means, as, as would K KL. Okay, um, and, and, and so kind of the, the punchline here, this is probably the, the, the nearly the best result we know so far, is that uh, the upper and lower bounds uh, on minimax regret are in terms of this constrained DEC um, uh, with, with the mo module of the fact that there is this estimation uh, error gap, uh, which is typically of a lower order than the overall problem. Okay, okay um, there's an in interesting connection to what's called modules of continuity in statistics, which is a, uh, um, um, characterizes complexity of a, a problem of estimating a linear functional of your distribution. Uh, there is a classical work by Donovan Liu, um, uh, Arkady, and and and, and uh, uh, Tole Yuditsky, uh, and, and and so forth. So um, the the uh, I'm, I'm I'm you know writing this very much in the same form as as you saw before with the constrained DC. It's the you're looking at the ball around some uh, nominal model M hat, the Hellinger ball, and then you're looking how much the linear functional of the distribution can change. Right. So modules of continuity. Right. Now, um, the interesting part is is this is a linear function, and our functional is not linear. It's not linear because we have f star of pi star. It's a maximization. Maximal decision of the mean, and that makes it nonlinear. So the results from uh, estimation of linear functional do not apply here, uh, but they 
the, 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 this is a, an interesting counterpart to kind of classical um, non-interactive uh, estimation. This is interactive and it's a nonlinear um, version of that, if you wish, or at least some, some analog of that. Okay, so I, I'm just gonna close in the last four minutes um, um, with the question of these methods. The, are the methods that are arising from this uh, at all practical? Um, because so far we just talked about the equations and uh, this is the epilogue. Um, I, I'm going to consider the problem of multi arm bandits, but with the context. This is called the contextual multi arm bandit. Uh, you can think of the a doctor observing the patient, making a decision and observing the reward. But there is no other observation beyond the beyond the reward. Okay. Okay. The the, the model um, just as before, you know, before we had the f star of the decision, but now it's f star of the context and the decision. Right. You don't want to administer the same medication to everyone. You want to make it uh, personalized. Right. So x t is the personalization. And uh, we, again, we assume that the F star is, let's say, a neural network, right? So what, what should we be doing? Well, it turns out that this uh, uh, DEC program that I wrote as a min max, in this case, can be solved in a closed form. Um, temporally, this is completely opposite because we first found this, then we try to generalize, and then we realize that it's a solution. Like the general problem is the min max problem. And, and, and now I'm going backwards and, 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 and saying that there is a closed form solution in this case. Um, and, and it's just a, what we call inverse gap weighting distribution. So solution is you compute online regression estimate. Um, let's say you do a, a Azuri Wolf uh, Wormuth forecaster that's the, for linear functions or a kernel or whatever. Um, once you've computed this, you, uh, plug in the observed context and evaluate the gap of the decision to the best estimated decision, right? So, so th this, is the, you, th this is the estimate of what you think is the best action, right? Under this uh, estimated scores, right? So all of these are positive quantities and depending on uh, uh, predicted suboptimality of each action, you, you create this, you know, kind of one over X type of distribution. That is the optimal distribution for this problem. Um, historically, the uh, interesting thing, Phil Long and, and uh, uh, Abe, uh, <laughs> I don't know how they discovered a, a version of this, um, but this was the first paper, I think, on contextual bandits. And it was forgotten because UCB came along and people just started to do uh, uh, kind of exp exponential weights type of methods. Uh, not ECB, sorry, uh, exponential weights, I should say. Um, and uh, um, but but this turns out to be a kind of the right algorithm. Okay, uh, it, it's interesting. It's a decision making without any confidence computations or without optimism. Right? We're not we're not carrying around confidence bands. Um, this uh, has been implemented, and it's now part of this uh, Microsoft uh, um, decision making uh, uh, suite. And uh, we, we ran experiments and compared, I should say Dylan ran yeah. experiments and compared to these results in the 2018 paper by Bieti, Agarwal and Langford. Um, our method is called squared CB. And uh, okay, the long story short is it, it does very well. And then if we tweak it with some additional truncation, it beats everything on, on all the data sets that we've, uh, we've uh, considered. So that we compare it to Thompson sampling and uh, uh, epsilon greedy, all, all kinds of uh, different uh, contextual bandit methods. So maybe there is some uh, room for theoretical research in this area. Um, uh, we've extended these results to adversarial decision making. This is where the model changes at every time step, um, but still stays within the class of models. Uh, the we've extended the reinforcement learning results to model free setting um, for those who know what it is. We've extended the, re the these results to 
uh, gamma regret for combinatorial problems such as uh, submodular optimization. Um, we've extended these results to multi-agent decision making, um, and there has been kind of a quite a few um, uh, papers on this topic now in the community. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you uh, that we can break up the decision making problem into estimation and and the very precise prescription of how to do exploration. Um, this was not, I guess, fully understood before. Um, we've written, we've we created a course on this, uh, uh, on the subject, and 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 the, the puts together decision making and all the different, uh, um, you know, in, in different setups, contextual bandits, structured bandits, and so forth. You can check out the course and the course notes, and we're writing some kind of uh, book uh, my, uh, manuscript with uh, with Dylan Foster. Thank you. So uh, how does the lower bound relate to Gravesend layer lower bound, which gives instance uh, optimal lower? Good, good, good question. So these are not instance optimal bounds. These are minimax mm -hmm. bounds. So the, the uh, right, we, we write as min max problem, and that, 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 that's our problem. We're not, we're not letting t go to infinity, fix the problem, let t go to infinity. So could you define a similar complexity measure for instance optimality? Yeah, so, so uh, some work on this has been done by Dylan um, and and uh, Philip, um, it's it's on on archive. Uh, one last question. Uh, so how uh, how do you choose gamma in your algorithm? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so gamma. You in experiments we did um, some kind of cross validation of reading, um, and there is a theoretical prescription if you know the complexity of the class. But thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was curious if you've examined any connections to the information directed sampling algorithm, which is, of course, it's Bayesian. But is there any connection between the DEC and information yeah, gain? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, this is something I didn't have time to go into. So the uh, the the way to view a posterior sampling methods is to swap the min and max in that problem, and uh, um, then you can you can show that. Um, like Thompson sampling, posterior sampling provides a, a guarantee in the dual. It's a very nice duality framework. Um, in, in fact, for, for for about a year, we knew of a, a a result that you could only get through this dual point of view, but it doesn't give you the frequentist uh, algorithm. But then we, we did find that. Because there has to be a frequency algorithm because uh, uh, yeah, min max is equal to min max min in these problems. So there has to be a you know, Thanks. Uh, how does the, the condition for smooth data, that dp upon oh, yes. dp, less than sigma inverse, how does that look under Markovian? Okay, so, so this is something I, did, I, did, I, did, I didn't. I, I promised that I didn't say. So in the contextual bandit problem, it's especially interesting because I can assume now that x's are smooth. My decisions are still not smooth, but in the contextual bandit problem, at least the the version that I showed, it's a finite set, and uh, any distribution supported on a finite set is smooth with that. Parameter cardinality because because the Radon Nicodemian derivative to the uniform is one over at most one over uh, or, or at most the cardinality. So it's interesting in the, um, in the contextual bandit setting uh, because here we're fitting what was pi before and now it's really pi and x together. We're doing regression on the the tuple pi and x. Was this person uh, with these symptoms, and we prescribed this, and then the outcome was that, right? So the regression is is on on, on functions of both x and pi, and so if you want smoothness of the x pi pair, you can assume smoothness of the x, and then you get smoothness of the pi for free if it's a finite. That, that that's the application. It goes because extends the scope of. Um, I guess 
what, what happens if you do least squares to fit the path data, and then you do some exploration on top. Uh, it shouldn't work for arbitrary data, but it works for this sort of data. Uh, maybe a quick follow-up on that. So you mentioned that least squares actually attains this slow rate and it's unimprovable. For, for smooth data. And it's unimprovable in what sense? I mean, it's unimprovable for a problem. Where you know, uh, exists a problem where least squares, sequence of least squares, uh, gets squared of theory. But this is not a not a slow rate for every model class. This is a, there exists a model class for which. Okay. So, still, yeah, I think we don't fully understand that. Uh... All right. Um, thanks very much, Sasha. Can you please give him a round of applause.